Today, our 1955 F100 is getting an aftermarket chassis and all-new suspension. Then we're taking a look at the small yet powerful Ford EcoBoost engine and 5-speed that'll make up the drivetrain. And we're showing you how to pressure test your cooling system components. It's all today, here on Truck Tech. Hey guys, welcome to Truck Tech. Today we've got our 55 F100 in the shop. Now the truck's been in the building for a while, but now we're ready to really kick this project off right and get it started. I think you guys are really gonna dig some of the stuff we've got planned for today. We've got big parts of the drivetrain, a solid foundation to set our chopped cab and new bed on, and some suspension parts to check out. Now in case you guys don't remember, this is the F100 that we picked up as somebody else's abandoned project. They'd already chopped the top and done a bunch of body work to the cab as part of their project progress. But then they lost interest or something changed and the truck came up for sale. So we scooped it up to pick up where they left off. Now the frame on the truck had already been modified. Somebody's hacked up the cross member and welded in a couple of new engine mounts. I've also seen a few fatigue cracks and well, there's no telling how straight the original frame is. So when it came time to making a decision on what to do for a foundation for our old truck, well, we could either keep the stock frame, clean up the modifications, reinforce it, and get ready for a new round of suspension mods, or we could go with something that's much better in the long run. So we decided to go with an all new frame and picked up this beautiful piece from JW Rod Garage. Now they've got a setup for a four link rear suspension and a Mustang two front suspension. And for you guys familiar with the 53 to 56 Fords, you know that the wheel isn't centered in the wheel well. So when we order our frame, we had them make a common modification. And we've got Eric from JW Rod Garage here to tell us a little bit more about this thing. What we typically do is move the front cross member forward about an inch and a quarter, just so that the wheel location is a little more aesthetically pleasing in the fender well. Some of the other cool features of our frame is that it's made out of all 10 gauge steel. We TIG weld the entire frame, everything's fully ground. We also install the nuts in the frame so that you can mount the running board mounts. We do a movable transmission mount, which we just tack weld in so you can slide it forward and back on the tubes in order to mount any transmission you want. That's affixed to our tubular center section here. It's going to give you a lot more strength than the original factory frame cross member. Now the cab mounts and the forward box mount are in an OE location. Everything will bolt right up. And they've added a relief to the rear frame rail for axle clearance so you can run at a nice low ride height if you want to. Now these guys make more than just 53 to 56 F100 frames, so tell me what else you guys do and how do you do it? Well, we make anything from Ford, Chevy, Mopar frames from 28 all the way up into the 50s. Um, all of our frames are fully welded in a jig. When we can, we use original frames and blueprints to try and get them as precise as possible. Now, in addition to frames, they also make and sell suspension components. We went with their parallel four bar and pan heart system for the rear. The brackets and links are all made in-house. Everything's TIG welded and looks really, really nice. To keep the rear end of the truck supported, we went with Viking Performance double adjustable coilovers with a 10 inch spring with a 225 pound in inch rate. For the front suspension, we went with more of their parts. These are our tubular front control arms that we make out of inch and a quarter tubing. We've got Brand new updated power rack. Viking coilovers for the front again, also double adjustable with 600 pound springs and our standard spindles. Now all this stuff on the table is gonna be a huge step forward for our old 55 F100. If you guys are interested, check out the JW Rod Garage website. Eric, thanks for bringing all this stuff by and giving me lots of work to do. Good luck. <laughs> thanks, <laughs> should be fun. There's really no luck needed. At this point, it's like assembling a full-size model. It's new parts on new parts, and it doesn't get any more straightforward than this. Now, none of these parts are painted or powder coated. That's because we're gonna wait till we have the thing fully assembled, all plumbed, and brackets welded on, and then send it out for powder coat or paint. This is just for mock-ups so we can make the truck a roller. Now the front shock uses a bearing mount instead of a bushing. After installing one of the circlips, we can install the bearing. After we apply a little anti-seize so no corrosion happens in between the steel bearing and the aluminum housing. We're also applying some to the threaded shock body.
Now this thrust bearing or Torrington bearing basically allows the spring to rotate on the spring seat easily. It's basically a bunch of little bearings stacked up around the perimeter and when sandwiched in between these two washers allows the spring to rotate nice and smooth. A little bit of anti-seize on it will keep things moving freely. Now like we mentioned, these shocks are double adjustable meaning you can adjust the shock firmness or its resistance to movement in both the compression or the downstroke or the rebound stroke. And the 600 pound rate springs, that basically says that it takes 600 pounds to compress the spring one inch. That's how coil springs are rated. install this thing. Now the tube on the rear leg of the control arm is just a hollow tube, but the one on the front is threaded to accept the coilover mount bolt. Now I'm using a ratchet strap to help compress the spring a little bit so we can get the castellated nut on our spindle. Now one thing we haven't talked about with our new chassis is cost. With the brand new frame and all new front and rear suspension components, we're sitting at about six grand. That's really not that bad when you consider all the work that went into the frame and all the new parts we've got. Plus, it'll allow us to hit the ride and handling fast forward button and go from the mid 50s right into the modern era. All right, now we've got our suspension installed and mocked up. Everything except for the track bar or panhard bar. Now these four link bars is what controls the axle's location and positioning front to back. But the panhard bar is what locates the axle laterally. Now this end is gonna get attached to the axle housing tube, where the other end is gonna get welded to the frame rail. But there's no point in welding it on now since we don't have an axle. Looking pretty good though. After the break, we'll take a close look at our EcoBoost power plant and later how to check your cooling system for leaks. Stay tuned. Hey guys, welcome back to Truck Tech. Now with the chassis of our 55 F100 coming along nicely, it's time we pay some attention to the drivetrain that we've got picked out for our classic truck. Now we knew right away we wanted to keep Ford power underneath our Ford hood, so that narrowed things down for us right away. Now we kicked around ideas like a vintage hot rodded flathead, a new dual overhead cam Coyote 5 liter, a stroke pushrod V8, or something with a supercharger strapped to the top of it but what we ended up going with was a V6. Now, before you throw your drink at the TV screen or your computer screen, you need to take a closer look at what's underneath the crate. This is Ford's 3.5 liter EcoBoost twin turbo V6. It makes 365 horsepower at 5,500 RPM and 420 pounds of torque at just 2,500 RPM. It features direct injection with the fuel sprayed directly into the combustion chamber and with fuel pressures of over 2,000 PSI. It's got an electronically controlled throttle, so that means no more cable, just a foot pedal with a sensor in the cab. The turbos are small, but water-cooled for durability and to keep temps down. They spool up quick and make about 12 PSI of boost. It's even got a factory oil cooler to keep engine oil temps down. Now to get a closer look at one of these water-cooled turbos, I went ahead and pulled one off. Look at the turbo inlet. The port is tiny. It's even smaller on the manifold side. And the turbine and the compressor wheels are equally as small. But with the small ports and the small turbo, well, it virtually eliminates any turbo lag. This thing will spool up like right now. And also keep in mind that this thing is rated at 420 pounds of torque. That's pretty stout. My 94 Dodge with the Cummins turbo diesel is rated at the same 420 pounds and it's a one ton truck. So technology has come a long way and you can get a lot of output out of a small package. Also remember that just recently we dyno tested an F-150 with this engine and picked up an additional 75 rear wheel horsepower. So I'm pretty anxious to shoehorn one of these in between the frame rails of our 55. Now to go behind our high-tech V6 is this tried and true Tremec TKO 600 five-speed manual transmission that we picked up from American Powertrain. 
Now, we went with a manual for a couple of reasons. One, I just plain like driving a manual transmission equipped vehicle that much more. Plus, it keeps it simple. We don't have to worry about a late model, electronically controlled automatic, its related wiring and controller. Now, the reason we didn't go with a six speed is I often find that six gear is rarely used. Plus, the smaller five speed will be easier to fit inside the transmission tunnel. Now, this thing's got a torque capacity of 600 pound feet. Plus, it only weighs 99 pounds. It's got a first gear of 2.87 to 1 and an overdrive ratio of 0.64 to 1. So we'll have a nice low highway cruise RPM. And with our engine's big fat torque curve, we won't have to do a bunch of shifting to stay inside the power band. To attach our transmission to the engine, we're using this quick time bell housing. It's made from high strength steel and it's twice as strong as your typical steel bell housing. It's got laser cut flanges, it's spin formed and CNC machined. This thing is designed to be the lightest, strongest and most accurate steel bell housing you can get. Plus, it's SFI certified for you guys that are doing some racing. Now, we set out to build our 55 F100 to be a great all around performer. It's not just a drag truck or an autocrosser or a cruiser. We want it to be good at everything. So we think with our new frame and suspension and our unique drivetrain combination, we'll get just that. Up next, we're checking out LMC Truck. Stick around. Hey guys, welcome back to Truck Tech. Now, some of the biggest decisions you've got to make when planning a restoration have to do with replacing hard to find or obsolete parts. And for over 30 years, owners have turned to a one-stop resource, LMC Truck. There's no greater feeling than getting behind the wheel of a truck you helped put together. From Jerry Patton's 51 Chevy. I definitely would say that trucks have brought my son and I closer together. To teenager Mariah Campbell's 78 Ford. I started driving it because I've always loved this truck. All sorts of their parts from this catalog. This is LMC Truck, the world's largest distributor of truck parts and accessories. I don't really think of us in those terms as the largest truck part distributor. I think of us more of as a company that helps people enjoy their life better. So the billet grill will pop into original position. LMC president and owner Becky Hanrahan knows customers' trucks mean much more to them than just transportation. That's why everything they manufacture is better than new. When they put that headlight bezel on, they're remembering the time that they did it with their father or their grandfather, or it reminds them of the time that their whole family piled into the truck and went and got ice cream or went down to the swimming hole. To stay accurate with their catalog illustrations and specs, LMC maintains a serious collection of early and late model trucks and SUVs. This doubles as a test bed for the thousands of parts they manufacture themselves. They didn't exactly build a perfect truck back then. And so we're trying to take some of the secondary issues out of the parts as we develop. We fix a lot of parts that had a lot of original issues. We've got to also have a fully staffed research department that supplies us with the information that we need to create schematic drawings that will help the customer guide them through their restoration project, almost as a shop manual approach, not just to be able to buy the part, to know how to put it on their vehicle as well. The promise LMC made to truck owners 33 years ago holds true today, to provide the right part at the right price right now. And thanks to social media, feedback from customers worldwide is immediate. When people come to us and ask us about, do you have this part, generally the answer is yes. Just about every single time, we want to be that one-stop place that you go to to find everything you need to, to restore the entire truck. Customer feedback doesn't end there. Truck owners are just as eager to share why their truck is so special to them. LMC Truck Life was born one afternoon in my office when we were talking about all the stories that we had, and we had file cabinets full of all these old stories that people had sent us, and they just weren't stories about their trucks. They were stories about their rebuild, about their family. They were full of photos and, and just rich, rich stories. And it was sad to see those stories just sitting in a file cabinet someplace. So we decided to give people a place that they could go and tell their stories. My name is Chris Baker, and this is my truck story. A few they've turned into mini movies. Lots of people say, oh, you're stuck in the 50s or whatever, but it's a good place to be stuck, I think. <laughs> if anything, it's a good hobby, you know? It's, it's something you can uh, be proud of. You put the work into it and you see instant results. 
This is so much more than just selling truck parts to customers. It has a lot of memories in it. It's the first truck I drove. We feel that we're helping them keep their history going. It's the truck we were driving when I got my first deer. Their piece of the past going forward. Went and got the LMC truck magazine and ordered the parts and went to work on it. You know, it's, it's everything. I received so many letters from people saying thank you for what you do, for helping us keep our trucks running. And you hear so many great stories. And with LMC Truck Life, I've had the privilege to go on the road and visit a lot of these customers. It's fun. And there's nothing more satisfying than that. Hey guys, welcome back to the shop. Now, if you've got a hard to find antifreeze leak somewhere in your cooling system, well, a cooling system pressure tester like this one that we picked up from Matco Tools can be really helpful. It works pretty simply, just attaches to the top of the radiator or overflow bottle. You pump it up, pressurize the system, and it'll force out any leaks so you can pinpoint the problem area and make the appropriate repair. But you can also use it to test radiator caps because they're what dictate what pressure the system operates at. Just attach the adapter to the pump, lock it in, attach the cap, and pump it up until you hear the air bleed out. Then you can check what pressure it's holding. In our case, it's about 15 PSI, which is good because our cap is rated at 16 pounds, so it's pretty close. Now you guys probably know water has a boiling point of 212 degrees. And for every pound of pressure water is under, it raises that boiling point by about two and a half degrees. So by having 15 or 16 pounds of system pressure, we can raise it from 212 degrees to about 250. Now, if you didn't have the system under pressure and you got over 212, well, water would start boiling, creating air pockets and puking out of the overflow. And you could quickly overheat. Not good, obviously. So if you've got a cooling system problem and you're overheating, well, it might be worthwhile to pressure test your cap. Now, if you've got an 07 or newer Jeep JK Wrangler and you've added larger tires to it, well, you've also added to the amount of stress that the steering box sees. So JKS Manufacturing has developed this brace kit that alleviates some of that stress. The kit includes a front track bar chassis brace, a steering box sector shaft brace, and the linkage and bracketry necessary to tie it into the opposing frame rail. And by tying everything together, you can solidify the steering on the front end of your Jeep. Now, if you're anything like me, you like to get a little fresh air inside the cab, even if it's raining. But unless you want to get the door panel wet, well, it'd be a good idea to install some of these wind deflectors from Stampede Products. Now, installation couldn't be any easier. Simply remove the outer liner of the tape, stick them in place, and you're just about done. They also cut down on overall wind noise. Now, these happen to be for a 2014 Chevy or GMC, but they make them for just about every late model truck on the market. Now, if you've got an older F-150 or Expedition and it's got a few miles on it and you want to get that new suspension feel back without breaking the bank, check out these suspension kits from rockauto.com. The kit includes new lower control arms, upper control arms, inner and outer tie rod ends, along with the adjusting sleeves, jam nuts, and the rest of the hardware you're going to need to complete the installation. And with new bushings and ball joints in the upper and lower control arms and new tie rod ends, hopefully you'll get some of that new truck feeling back all with one part number. Guys, thanks for watching Truck Tech. See you next time.